everyone, and welcome to Mountaineer Farm Talk. Um, every Friday at 10 a.m., we are here to discuss everything agriculture. I'm J.J. Barrett, Extension Agent from Wood County. And, also and I'm John have, David Johnson, Jackson County Extension Agent. And we also have Evan, Evan Wilson. Evan Wilson, uh, the Ag Agent for Cabell and Wayne. Cabell and Wayne. And our special guest today is Dr. Carlos Casada. Carlos, how are you doing this morning? Good. Thank you for having me. Good. Um, Carlos is going to be talking about spring pests in the garden. Uh, insects can do a lot of damage in the backyard vegetable garden. And Carlos is going to talk about some uh, management strategies and some things that we can, can do to control insects to make your 2021 20, garden a smashing success. So if you're here, you're definitely interested in uh, animal health, forages, crop production, farm management, uh, commodity markets, country and Western music, rural health issues, gardening, horticulture, and other topics that are related to agriculture and farming. So once again, join us every Friday at 10 a.m. for Mountaineer Farm Talk, and we will learn, share, laugh, and enjoy a cup of cowboy coffee or herbal tea for non-coffee drinkers. We encourage audience participation, so everyone have your questions ready, and you can either put those in the chat box um, or you can ask some questions. What's, that's what we're here for. The uh, We're all here to learn a little bit, and I want to talk just a bit about uh, Carlos. He uh, did some of his uh, master's and doctorate work at Purdue University. Um, he's, he is looking at chemical and biological approaches to manage and scale insects. Um, and he also did some work with Penn State University, um, working on pesticide education. Um, and did we miss anything there, Carlos? Can you tell us a little bit more about your, about your background? No, that's, that's fine. It goes, um, I am originally from Honduras, for those that are wondering about my accent. Um, and I'm in Penn State, so I work with uh, pesticide education. And here at uh, West, uh, um, West Virginia University, you know, just trying to do research about how to improve integrated pest management for people, you know, in, on the way that we can improve their uh, their crop, crop production, but also reduce that um, insecticide in that environment. So it's environmental safety. Okay. Um, <clears throat> JD, why don't you go ahead and start us out with some, some questions to get the conversation going for Carlos. Definitely. Um, you know, every year we grow a garden and every year those pests kind of sneak in on us and uh, they, they take their amount that they want to eat and we take our amount that we want to eat and hopefully we plant enough for the raccoons and the deer as well. But, you know, there, there are some ways to start to help control those pests. And I'd say the first way is to scout. You know, get out there, look around, see what you have out there, see what can be a problem down the road and identify that problem before it's a problem. So what do you have for us on the best ways to scout and, and how to get out there and, and, and what to look for when you're scouting? Well, that's, that's a really good question. And with insects, with insects, that's a little more tough than other, other pests because, you know, there are so many insect species and usually 90% uh, of the insects that you see, they're not a pest, they just happen to be there. So what I would recommend you is, once you know what you're going to have in your garden, go to the university pages and find what are the key pests for those specific crops. Like for example, if you happen to have uh, apple tree, for example, on your on your on your backyard, you know, like you should know what are that insects that will affect the apples specifically, because you know some insects will feed on cucumbers, but they will not feed on tomatoes. 
or, you know, or some insect will feed in both of them. So uh, I think uh, the first step is knowing your plants, uh, knowing the plants that you're gonna have, and then go and read about what are the key pests for those plants. Because uh, once, if you don't know what you're looking for, it's really hard to scout it. You know, like it's also important to know what are the um, beneficial insects that you have. Because sometimes uh, you may find, you know, one or three aphids, but if you have one or two predators also in the same place, you don't have to do anything because the predators will take care of those aphids, you know. So um, I think the first step will be knowing your key pests, basically. So education, just kind of educating yourself. Okay. Yes. And I, I like that answer. And so, so are you saying when we see a an aphid, we don't need to nuke the whole garden right then, right? We is what? So tell us a little bit about thresholds. You know, because a lot of people they see that see that one bug, two bugs, and then they go spray happy. They just spray everything and insecticide, right? So you know, tell us a little bit about thresholds and how that plays a part when to treat and maybe when not to treat. Yeah, uh, for example, this it, it is better when we use specific examples because, you know, um, with insects it's very complicated because one answer may be wrong for other, for other insects, you know, like for example, aphids, it's fine to have 20 aphids in a big plant, but it probably too much in a small plant. So that's something that we should also consider. Like, are we in the beginning of the season or are we in the end of the season? Like, for example, if you have tomatoes in the beginning of the season, if you have some aphids, then you should keep looking if those aphids are reproducing quickly, and then like, for example, if you have 10 aphids uh, this week, you should be alert, come back the next week. And if you see 20 or 30, then you start thinking, okay, these aphids are reproducing too fast, so I should spray something. But if you're in the end of the season and you have 100 aphids, you already have your tomatoes, they're almost ready to, to you know, to pick up. You don't have to do anything. Because, I mean, the plants will give you what they have already. So it depends on the time, it depends on that insect, it depends on uh, on that um, on that specific plant uh, pest. Just to give you another no related example with gardens, if you have one or two mosquitoes in your house, that's not a big deal, right? You're not going to spray all your house for one or two mosquitoes. But if you have two mosquitoes in the hospital, then it may be a big deal, you know? So it depends where you are. It, it's, it's, I don't want to give a specific uh, thresholds because that will change depending on or many, many factors. Like we're talking about aphids, for example, uh, in the garden, but in the garden you have vegetable, but you also have uh, ornamentals. So you probably will wanna take care more of your aphids in your vegetable because you uh, your main point is getting food, but your ornamental is more about the looking so you you may be a little more flexible for ornamental. So it will, the thresholds will depend on, um, on the crops that you have. But once you say threshold, threshold is basically that amount of insects that uh, you can allow to be on your plants. And then depending on the plants, there are some amount of insects uh, that some populations that when you reach that threshold, you should apply an, uh, um, a control method, not necessarily an insecticide. Uh, uh, you should do something so you can reduce uh, those populations to, you know, to lower those populations and you don't have a big problem in the end or like they don't 
I think that was a good answer because you know you hit it right on the head. I mean, you're going to have bugs out there. Okay, every yeah. garden's going to have insects, but you know you don't have to spray if there's you know little small populations and or at the end of the the growing season you have to take care of those tender small plants in the beginning if they have a big population but that you know you got what damage can you live with and what damage can you not live with it's kind of where we kind of look at that threshold and and each bug is going to have a different threshold and each plant is going to have a with able to stand a different threshold so that's part of that education that uh, Carlos was talking about in the beginning, knowing what your plant insects are, but also knowing how much those plants can take of those insects. Carlos, Except, let's get, and also, I, I, sorry, I just changed my my background right now. Mm -hmm. So um, right here uh, on my, this is my left. So on my left, oh, actually it's top and bottom. So here you we have, I will take off my picture so you can see better. Let me see. So knowing what you have is very important. Here we have two insects that to the naked eye, sometimes they look similar. It's in the bottom, in the bottom we have a memorate sting bug. And in the top, we have another sting bug, but it's actually a, a predator. So you should know what you have, because if you go to your garden and you see the one on the top, you actually, if you, you actually have something that is beneficial, something that will be feeding on your aphids or other, uh, other pest problems. But if you have the one in the bottom, then uh, you have a big problem because you have tomatoes, for example, they will be affecting your tomatoes. So um, um, the way to distinguish between these two, uh, as you can see over there, there are some, um, uh, circles uh, where you can see that uh, thorax of that insects and someone is uh, the one in the top is pointy and the one in the bottom is rounded so that's some little things that you sh can um, that you should know to distinguish between some some insects and the others and then from then you can decide it, do I spray do I do something or I actually, in some cases, I'm actually having a predator who will help me to control other pests. But some people will think, oh, this is a memory steam book. I have to kill it. And they will be like applying pesticide for it. So that's some example of why going, scouting and identifying correctly the pest is very important. Okay. Yeah, Carlos, I want to hit some specifics. Uh... I want to talk about squash first. I mean, I, I grow a lot of pumpkins, but uh, I have a lot of questions. We have here in the middle High Valley, people grow uh, yellow crookneck, zucchini, all those different uh, squashes. The squash vine borer, what are some, some info you can give us on that as far as what to look for um, and what control methods that we can use for that uh, pest? Well, first of all, um, first of all, this is a moth, right? Usually, when you talk with entomologists, or if you know a lot about entomolo entomologies or about insects, um, moths are more active during the night. That's very This is a very particular for this moth that this moth specifically is active during the day. I think that's that's something that people should know. I, for me, I'm an entomologist, so to me, that's awesome. I would like to know why. I don't know why, honestly, but I would like to know why. So anyway, this pest, um, something else that you should know about this pest is only have one generation a year. So that's something that uh, you should be aware or only at a specific time of the year. So this pest will overwinter um, on the soil and will come out on the middle of June and go and go through July. So that means that those are the only time of the year that you should be looking for this pest. 
So what they what uh, uh, the main damage the uh, that uh, yeah the main damage is do by the larva. So basically, the life cycle on this is the adults will come out sometime in the middle of June or late June, depending where you are. They will lay eggs on your plant, then that, that eggs will hatch, and the larva will introduce in this will introduce in cell or will bore in cell in that stain stain of, of the plant. Then will feed in that in that stain and will blow the water uh, and nutrients going to the rest of the plant. Uh, so the way that you should control that is there are many different ways uh for example um a cultural way will be crop rotation so you know like crop rotation is basically changing the crops uh, every year or every season and another could be uh planting late and when i that's that's what i mentioned it only have one generation a year because if it was something that have more than one generation a year, then that's something that wouldn't work, you know? So then planting late, whenever, uh, sometime probably in July, uh, that is, the problem with planting late, as you know, um, oh, sure. you know, planting late could be, could have other problems, like uh, you will be the person who will have your crops in the end, and. Sometimes the prices and all that, you have to play with that as well. Uh, but anyway, planting time can be uh, another cultural control and uh, row crops. So uh, with the row crops, you can um, avoid this insect to come into your, um, into your plant and lay the, the eggs. The problem with row crops is that uh, sometimes uh, you row covers? I mean, sorry, row covers, yes. Oh, row covers. Yes. Now, what, um, just to go back a sec, if, like, say they have zucchini, they have yellow crookneck, um, that plant wilts, what's the, what's the chances that, uh, that that's squash vine borer, and what else, what other evidence can they look for if they, uh, if they suspect that this is, uh, the squash vine borer? Uh, well, you can take the plant and you can open it and you will see it's, it's a decent size um, larva. So you can you can open it and then you will see the larva in there. Um, another uh, another sign is, is that insect. That insect is, let me see, I have a picture over here, so I will. I you know, typically the uh when I have people call, they'll say, uh, well yesterday I watered all my plants and this morning I came out and my half of my zucchini was wilted on the ground. And I'm <laughs> so that's usually the is that you're saying unless they're really scouting well, that's one of the first signs that they'll see. Well that you will see the adult first. So the way as I mentioned, uh, this is a moth, but they are uh, flying during the day. They're big. They have this beautiful color. You see the color over there is um, is like orange and, and black. Uh, they're very easy to very easy to see. And the other way that you can, if you have a zucchini and you know that you may have this, what you can do is in the middle of June. You can place a, a, a bowl, a yellow bowl with water and a little bit of soap. And then these insects uh, like the yellow color. So you will, you will get some of these insects uh, on that bowl with water. And then that's when you know that you have them and you should be prepared. The, the point with this insect is that you should be, you should do something before he lay that eggs because once um once the larva is inside and the plant is wilting there is no much you can do now i had on that list about uh fair or fair or sticky traps do they have ones for that for that pest 
Are there not that I know, uh, not that I know. I think that the easiest traps that you can do is this, uh, you can do yellow sticky card because they get attracted to, dead, to yellow. So that will work. Uh, but also, like I say, you can just buy one of those um, yellow balls with water, with a little bit of soap. And if they're there, you will catch them there. I'm also, like I say, read about their biology. That means uh, they tell you these insects in particular will come sometime in the middle of June. So that's when you should go to the field and try to see if you have it. In the oh. middle of June through July. You don't have to worry right now. You don't have to worry after July. That's the time that you should go and check for it. Yeah. Got uh, something else there, John David? Well, another pest that we have usually a little earlier in the year uh, in Jackson County in the, this warmer, humid climate is the cucumber beetle. And we had striped ones and we have spotted ones. Uh, and they usually kind of cause a little hardship on these young, tender plants. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, cucumber beetle control and kind of what we need to be looking for? See, I have, I have I prepared that, that picture too. So you can see on this side, uh, the spotted one and this side, that striped one. So there, um, and you know, on top of that, we have another insect that looks very similar to that. Is that uh, uh, Pond Ruwon beetle. So it just looks like this one right here. And that one won't cause much problem on your, on your vegetable. And the way that you can distinguish is because that one, their um, abdomen is yellow. And this one over here in the picture is black. But anyway, these two beetles um, are problematic in more uh, cucumber plants. Um, uh, well, actually, sorry, this one right here is more problematic on cucumber, and this one is more uh, generalized. That means that will feed in many other type of crops. So uh, they uh they feed sometime in in the roots so it's very hard to control them on their on the larva stage um something else i can tell you is uh sometime um this this one in my left is it the same left for you or <laughs> is this your left so this one over that's here. right that's your left all right okay so this one on your right um is more problematic in the north, and this one is more problematic in the south. But we are kind of in the middle, right? So we got both. Then we got both. You, we have we, we have both. Uh, and something that you should know about th these insects is um, they can they can transmit diseases. So and that's a big problem, especially when you have a small plants. And, and you have these beetles, they can transmit diseases. And that's uh, um, why uh, they, they're, a, they're a big problem. Yeah. Um, um, I'll way, go ahead. Way, way to, uh, to control these insects with non-chemical or non-insecticide ways to control these insects may be uh, crop rotation uh, because, you know, like they will overwinter I believe they overwinter as an adults. And when the spring starts, they will come and they will try to feed. And if they don't feed, they will die. So crop rotation uh, is a really good way to control uh, these, these insects. Another way also is um, something that is called intercropping. So it's basically when you have different crops, there have been some studies that have shown that when you plant a cucumber, any of the cucumber that you 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 you, you name it, and then uh, with broccoli and corn, that damage of these beetles uh, will be will be lower. Okay. Uh, what else? What else can I tell you about this beetle? 
um, I think also, you know, insecticides are also effective against this virus, and you can use several type of, of insecticide. They may be organic. There are a lot of organic products or they can be conventional. Now I will say uh, <clears throat> organic products will work, uh, but they're a little short lived than some of the other things that we use like Excel or something like that. Uh, I, I don't know, kind of a organic trial versus a traditional, uh, you know, insecticide trial looking specifically at cucumber beetles several years ago. And I noticed that, you know, if you look at our trends in our area five years ago, we get a lot of rain. This is probably one of the drier uh, springs that we've had in a while. And if the more rain you get with the organics, the more you have to reapply. So keep that in mind. If you are working with organic insecticides, you're probably going to have to reapply them more often than you would a traditional, which I'm not saying that's good or bad. I mean, that's, that's your preference, but kind of keep that in mind. It's not that you treat once and then you're done. Well, uh, something else that there are, there are a lot of, this is a big bet. So there are a lot of cool research about these, these insects and they have shown that, uh, for example, this, um, the cover crops, uh, covers, covers are, are really, uh, sorry, mulch, cover mulch are really good for this, uh, for this insect. So, uh, there have been some research indicating that, uh, the color of the color of, 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 you know, of this plastic mulch can actually affect uh, the feeding of, of this insect. And they, um, they, they recommending these uh, metallic colors because this kind of like affect the eyes of these, of these insects and they, they, they don't like it. So there are also some kind of a uh, straw mulch uh, that make difficult for this insect to move from one way, from one place to another, but also uh, this uh, type of mulch increase uh, spiders. And this insect really is like spiders. Obviously, spider eat them, but not just, it's, it's not just spider eating this insect. It's like, if they see a spider, they will go away. So it's kind of like a, a predator, but also a, a repellent, you know? So that's, that's uh, some of the cool research I, I, I have. Um, Which I don't blame them. You know, if I see a spider, I'm going away too. I don't like spiders. <laughs> I'm out on spiders. You know, anything with eight legs, ticks, spiders, whatever, I'm, I'm done for the day. I, I just, I have arachnophobia, they call it. But uh, that's sure the problem for me because I won't ever go down there to see how much damage is on the plant if there are a bunch of spiders running around there. <laughs> yeah, another another um, another way for this specific insect insect is also row row covers. Um, but if you have a cucumber, cucumbers really need really need their pollinators. So you have these row covers. They're great to keep insects out, but they're also great to keep pollinators out and something that you should, should keep in mind. If you use rock covers, um, you use it only on the places that you didn't plant the year before. Why? Because these insects overwinter on that soil. And if you have a rock cover, then they can just come from the, the soil and they will actually be safe from predators and they can reproduce and and they will give they will make uh, or they will produce a lot of damage so something that you should keep on mind for rock covers uh, that is a question we have from the audience too lisa uh asked if can you do anything to the soil before planting was a question from the audience there so is 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 that something you can do here? Honestly, uh, I'll tell you this. I I don't know. And when I say I don't know, is because uh, you can till, but for example, I know for a fact that uh, corn ro corn rootworm, uh, they they go deep enough that you won't kill them. 
So the best way in this case is crop rotation. So if you plant uh, a cucumber last year, don't, don't, don't do it in the same place. Just go to a different place and then, then you can use uh, row covers. If you plant a cucumber in the same place, row covers won't help you. Carlos, not to uh, maybe um, change direction here a little bit. Okay. I always have a lot of, of, of course, a lot of my master gardeners. We, I have a lot of, of gardeners that want to use a more natural approach. Uh, what are your opinions on some, some naturals like neem oil, insecticidal soap, uh, BT, and uh, I recommend spinosad to a lot of, uh, of uh, people that have insect issues. What are your opinion on those, if those work, um, and what different pests that we can apply those on? They're great. I actually like to recommend them, um, especially, uh, well, you mentioned several of them, and depending, of, depending on the pest that you, depending on the pest that you- Let's start with the neem, the neem oil first. So neem oils are good for, um, well, let's, let's go a little deeper here. So neem okay. oils will kill that insects with contact, but they also are, are repellent. So um, the, they will be good for uh, example, um, aphids, uh, white flies, uh, scale insects. Uh, well, for scale insects, they will be good for armor scale insects, but not for soft scale insects. So armor, uh, soft scale insects are those that, is, that uh, produce uh, honeydew, and armor scale insects are those that produce kind of like a, a cover that is an uh, arm. So they will be good for, for armor scale insects, but for, for not for uh, soft, uh, soft scale insects. What about uh, um, the spinosad? Spinosis is a great product um, and is uh, based on a bacteria. Um, it, 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 it is labeled for a lot of different pests. Um, um, but going a little back on oils, uh, oh. something and I would like to make clear about horticultural oils or any type of oils is that they can also kill your plant. So please read your label. Because if you use more than 2%, you can kill your plants. Also read the labels because if you apply it on the high temperature, it will also kill your plant. And something that I would like to mention about oils and many other contact, uh, many other organic uh, insecticides is that they, they usually uh, contact insecticide. That means that they only kill that insects whenever they get in, they, they contact, they, they, there is a contact, you know, so that's why they call contact insecticide. So the disadvantage of oils and soap and many of, the, of these products is that when they're dry, there is no effect. And that's, that's awesome for your, non-target organisms because you can apply it then for example if you have aphids aphids don't move that much so you you have to make sure to apply on the top of the plant but also on the base of the leaf because most of the aphids are on the base of the leaf and if you don't if you don't ap apply that insecticide directly to the insects you won't do anything so and um, once again once the insecticide is dry then there is no effect of, of, of some of those of those uh, of those uh, insects. So that's some of that are disadvantages of these of these products. Uh, that some people sometimes wanna use it for, um, let's say, Japanese beetle, for example. So Japanese beetle is very mobile, and you can up you can kill it, but the point is you will have other Japanese beetle coming, coming to your garden during any time of the days. And if you apply that oil and there is no more 
and they're dry, there is no more residues. They have almost like zero residues. So residue means the time of, of when you apply that in, insecticide that is in there and keep killing insects. Uh, and keep killing insects is the time between you, you, you apply it and the time that they keep killing insects. What about the, uh, the spinosad, my understanding, that's mainly for chewing type insects? Uh, I don't know much about spinosis, more like uh, it is um, it is based on uh, it is based on um, on the bacteria, but I know that it, it's used it's used a lot for fruit flies, uh, for uh, leaf miners, uh, for spider mites, uh, mosquitoes, ants. It's really good product for for many big pests, but um, I don't know exactly their mode of action. I know yeah. that I know that BT is on that way, that BT will uh, affect that stomach of that insects, but I don't know, honestly, I don't know how spinosis work. And Dr. Jet, one of his favorites is the BT to use in his arsenal. What, uh, what are your opinion on that as far as uh, for a natural, more natural type insect control? So BT is actually, when you use a BT insecticide, you call it that you're applying insecticide, but you're actually doing a biocontrol, a biological control, because you are spraying a bacteria that is naturally everywhere. So if you go outside in your garden and send a sample of soil, you will find BT. So BT is so safe, that the government used BT to control uh, black flies on, on rivers. So, you know, like applying pesticide on rivers is a big deal. That's, you never do that. <laughs> so that's so safe um, that they apply it there and they know they will not affect other uh, plants. They will not affect other fish. They will not affect other wild, uh, wildlife that are feeding on, uh, that are drinking from the water. Uh, BT is very uh, specific and there are different trains of BTs. Some of those trains are specifically for Lepidopterans, other for Coleopterans. And the point is, those are very specific. So they will only affect those uh, species those are uh, insects species uh, that, that, that you want to control. Okay. I'll add this, me and JJ, and we're going to work on some corn later on this year, but, uh, you know, we, we planted for years and years past the BT varieties of corn, and uh, especially the double BT, what they call it, with two BT traits in it. And it, it was amazing. I mean, we had regular corn on the sides. We had BT1, BT2. And you could really tell the difference in that BT2 strain because, I mean, there'll be other insects may get in there and it doesn't even affect the other insects, but it just affects that larva stage of that earworm. And that's the problem we have in sweet corn. And me and JJ, you know, I hate spiders. He hates earworms. I mean, he, 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 he'll go the other way when a fat, juicy earworm falls out the top. Now, that's not true. That is true. Don't lie. <laughs> What a gross! <laughs> being things, Use but, them for for bait or something for fishing. But you could tell the difference. I mean, the the larva would still get into that BT corn because it still has to start, you know, somewhere. But I mean, it barely got a start. It was, I mean, very minute uh, amount of of uh, size on that earworm, and then it died. Versus the other ones that did not have the BT, which big fat plump worms just eating high on the hog. So, um, but it was it was Absolutely. really interesting seeing that technology in that sweet corn and how successful it was. And I've been eating it for seven or eight years, and you know uh, yep. I haven't died, so you know I, it's pretty safe. <laughs> and the, and the reason and the reason why this insect is insecticide is very safe is because um, it attack that stomach of that insect of a specific pH of that stomach. So each, every single insect and animal have their own 
uh, I would say bacteria on, on, on their bellies or whatever you call it. And then that is very specific on the pH. And that's the reason why uh, this, uh, that's why BT is very specific to, to uh, either Lepidopterans, you say um, earworms, that's a, a moth, so it's a Lepidoptera, and sometimes there are other trains that are specific for, uh, I, I mentioned black flies, those are dipterans, and others for coleopterans. And, and you know, and it's, it's, it's very specific, it's uh, very good to control Lepidopterans uh, for, uh, uh, for coleopterans, no, it doesn't affect all the coleopterans. It, it only affects some specific uh, coleopterans that, that they are based on, yeah. Uh, Carlos, uh, if, if we're talking about uh, bug or insect control in the garden, and a lot of uh, traditional gardeners love to use seven dust. Of course, you know it's been around since the 50s. Uh, Carbaryl. Um, it is a tried and true um, insecticide. Of course, a lot of, we are getting some resistance, especially in Colorado potato beetle. Um, what is your opinion on that? And is it still a viable option for, for a lot of our gardeners? Okay, that's a really tough question to, to answer. <laughs> we ask the hard questions here. Well, this is, is to me it's a really tough question because uh Hassan representing the university I have to be careful of what to what to say you know like my opinion versus what I actually should say so first of all first of all I wanted to highlight that all the pesticides that are selling in the United States require a label and to produce the label there are hundreds of research uh, where it will, uh, the research that will figure out is this product effective? How can we use this product to don't harm that environment? How do we use this product to uh, be safe for the people who apply it to the people who, uh, or other people to animal wildlife, etc. right? So if you use these products using the label direction, they're fine, they're good. The problem is most of the pesticides I sell in United States are by for people that don't have any idea of how to use pesticides and they don't really actually read the label. So that being said, these products um it's actually toxic to people and if you you say dust so these products can be sell on uh liquid formulation or dry formulation there are many different dry formulations can be dust you mentioned dust can be granulates those are specifically very dangerous because you know like if you're applying in the field a little breeze comb and you will have all the dust on your face and then uh, getting exposed to this uh, insecticide is very dangerous because the way that they use to kill that insects is the same way that they can kill you, you know? So, bottom line, if you use the pesticides by, use, uh, by following the direction of the labels, you would be fine, but the problem is some people don't have an idea of how to use pesticides. And there are all, I, I don't know if I should, should say this or not, but there are many people against farmers saying that farmers are putting too much pesticide in the environment, in, in the environment blah, blah, blah. But at least farmers, they have a knowledge. They, they need a pesticide license to apply these products and to get this pesticide license they have to do tests that they're not easy and they they have a base knowledge of pesticide but there are these all others uh, pesticide that are sales on 
uh, you know, Walmart, Lowe's, Home Depot, whatever, buying for so many people that they don't read a label and they just apply it on on your on your gardens and and that's that's sometimes is a little dangerous. Yeah, the well, I think a lot of times, like for especially for Seven Dust, is an is a has been around for a while. For example, um, there is a product called Colorado Potato Bug Beater, which is uh, has the spinosad in it, and I recommend that to a lot of uh, gardeners instead of using the Seven Dust, like for their potatoes, because basically the they're resistant to the the carb the Seven Dust the active ingredient um, and this this other product is actually uh, a little bit safer to use and um, there's always a connection too bad we don't have shambling with us today uh, JD because the uh, the seven dust there there's some evidence that it's harmful to the bees because they'll actually think that's pollen what's your take on that Carlos could you repeat your question Oh, the seven dust and its effect on honeybees. Mm -hmm. um, I I don't I, I don't know about that. I probably they, they seven our carbonyl like you saying is is a pro spectrum insecticide. So that means that they basically will kill a bunch of bunch of different insects. So we were just we were just talking about BT and how BT was selective. So the opposite of selective is a pro spectrum. So pro spectrum means that they will kill whatever they feed on them or whatever they touch. So I wouldn't be surprised that this that seven is uh, is toxic to to to, to pollinators. Well, while um, we're I, about, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, while we're talking about, you know, potatoes and pollinators, you know, metacloprin is, uh, Nuprit is the uh, the shelf label there. Or the, uh, and if you spray that in the row before you put the, the potatoes, actually cover them up, it's a systemic. And we talked about, you know, you know, applying in, uh, insecticides, but, you know, a systemic gets actually in the plant and it can get in the pollen. And now a metacloprin is the active ingredient in Nuprit. So it can really affect uh, the bees there, but it is a wonderful insecticide for potato beetles. You put Nuprit on, you won't have a potato beetle in the field, but it can affect those bees. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, you, you're right, right now this is a hot topic on, on agriculture, pollinators and imiracropra that's that's very controversial right now uh, but what i can say is that's a great great insecticide uh this is very useful for farmers and uh, what we need to to know is learning about how we can reduce the exposure of this uh insecticide to you know to pollinators so one of the ways can be apply these products after the plant has flowered, for example, or, or basically avoid that these products is there during blooming because uh, uh, pollinators obviously looking for pollen. So uh, and that's uh, we should learn uh, a more more research about how can we keep you can keep using these products without affecting our, our pollinators. Yeah. But this is a great product. It is, and I've, we, I've, we've grown a lot of potatoes in Jackson County, and we, that's kind of a standard in potato production. And, but we really, I don't know if we have the volume of potatoes that's gonna cause that hive collapse, you know, that you see in, in areas with large amounts of potatoes. But uh, I think it, it's, it's one of the things that's causing the hive collapse, especially in those areas with large, you know, acreage of potatoes, which we, we do not have here. But, um, but I think there's probably a combination of many things that, that are really, you know, hammering the honeybees. That's just one of the things in the toolbox that are, is against honeybees right now. Well, yes, I, I agree with you, but also, I guess I can get a little controversial. Hopefully, there is not a 
people producing honeybees over here because they, they get a little bit angry. But the alternative that people are using are parutroids, which is, which is basically, in my opinion, worse because you know, parutroids will not only affect the pollinators, will affect every single insect that go and touch the plants will get killed because it's another broad spectrum insecticide. At least in Miracropre, you can put it as a systemic and you will have a less uh, environmental impacts, I will say, okay. uh, with a non-target effect than parietroids, but that's the alternative and that's what people are going for parietroids, which I don't know, man, is... Uh, what I, about birethrins and cyrethrins? Do they work the same? They're kind of in that same family of insecticides. Okay, there is parietroids are parietrins. Yes. Parietrins are organic, actually. They are based of, of, a, of a plant substance. So, um, whereas parietroids, uh, they, they are synthetic uh, insecticides. That means that they're uh, man-made, right? So, um, they basically have the same mode of action. Uh, that means that not because they are organic, they won't kill a lot of insects just like parietroids. Uh, but I think uh, parietroids may last a little more on the plant so that uh, residues will, will go longer. So um, uh, that being said, if you use parietroids, those are not organic, so you cannot use it on organic produce, production. But if you use parietroids, uh, then you can, you can use it in your organic, and they're great too. It's just like they are a broad spectrum insecticides and they will they will kill your natural enemies, they will kill your bees. Um, and on top of that, if you use these products early on the season, you will kill these uh, mite predators. And then because you kill the mite predators, you may have mite outbreaks on sometime on July or August or late on the season. Yeah, the the, uh, the pyrethins are the organic ones are um, extracts from from chrysanthemums or mums, correct? Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. But then the pyrethoids are the synthetics. Are synthetic that those are uh, man made? Yes, that's correct. I, I wanted to uh, squeeze another question in. We always have a lot of people that grow early in the season try to grow cabbage. Of course, you know the right always to grow what? <laughs> cabbage. Cabbage. Okay. Cabbage, because the you now the main culprit of cabbage are these uh, cabbage worms or loopers or you know there's two or three different types of of cabbage worms. What can a home gardener do to once they start seeing the evidence, the holes shoot in leaves? What are what are some things they can do or some maybe things for prevention and control for this pest? Well, I think the first things that they will see is the beautiful butterflies. <laughs> they're beautiful and they are like, they're just flying around, putting eggs everywhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, eggs, having fun. I, what I can recommend for this, uh, we were just talking about BT. It's great. BT okay. is great to control any type of lepidopterans and they're safe. There are safe products. So uh, that w that's one option. Another option is uh, this um, larva worms, uh, they are big. So you can just go and just pick them from the plant. Obviously, depending how many plants you have, right? Like if you have an acre full of, of kale, it's almost impossible to do and um, pick this, this uh, this insect, but if you only have like implants of kale or or any other uh, of this vegetable, you can just go and pick them before they start eating all your, your plants. Another uh, cultural or uh, mechanical control will be uh, row covers that that work well. So, because this is a big insect, uh, the butterflies are big. It's a big insect, and then you know, like it won't won't be able to get through those uh, 
to those covers. Um, and then, like I say, PT were well. Uh, Carlos, are you, what type of music do you listen to? You like country music? I do like country music. Yeah. All right. Who's your, who's your favorite artist? Well, I don't know the names per se, but I can tell you some songs. Okay. Um, so <laughs> an old one, uh, it will be, uh, I don't know if I will pronounce it correctly, but uh, Wagon Wheel. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, Christ. That's, Oh yeah, I, I think that's medicine, a classic. All pro medicine show. Yeah, a new kind of newish country music that that, that I like could be uh, Cruise, Cruise of uh, Florida or Georgia. Oh, Georgia, Florida Georgia Line Cruise. Yep. Um, okay. My new one, since I moved to West Virginia, it will be <laughs> you know. Let me guess, John uh, Denver. Take Take me home. <laughs> Take okay. me home on the road. So that's there we go. That's my new one. <laughs> All right, you're gonna fit right in. Country yeah. roads, take me home. I do have yeah. one question, JJ left. Um go ahead. Carlos, down here we have a problem with slugs in the home garden. What do you recommend for that? I know it's not really an insect. Well, you <laughs> yeah, slugs. Um well I guess you can put some kind of like a newspaper with water okay and on your garden and they will go through it uh especially i think during the night or during the you know sun they will go under it so you can uh that's a kind of like uh getting all of them to one place and um and then you can just kill it on the mechanical ways that you can, okay. you can use it um that's a new one i like there that. is there are some problems with that uh, neonicot noise, actually. Uh, there is a really, really interesting uh, research with uh, seed treatment, uh, corn seed treated, uh, how do you call that? Well, neonicot noise on corn. So basically what happened is these slows will come and will get some of these products, this insecticide to, to, their, to their system. And then when natural controls such as uh, ground beetles wanna eat them, they can eat them because they use these products to basically be toxic to, to their predators. So there's a very nice, I mm -hmm. mean, on my opinion, cool research about how actually um, neonicot noise are actually helping them to survive instead of killing them. Oh, so, okay. Lisa yeah. had a uh, made a statement too on here. She's you know said a uh, little beer in a pie tin will work for slugs. We we tried that too here and it, it did work. I just hate wasting the beer on the slugs, but uh, but uh, uh, she, it's she the blue ribbon. It's all right. That too. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the malted fermented you know beverage would bring them in too. I guess that's what it, it's worked for us too. Well, that's good to know. I something I learned today. I'm I, I'm not. I don't work with slugs, so I. Yeah, I, I think I, for uh, especially for <clears throat> some of our, for crop farmers, they'll use that as a uh, as a scouting mm -hmm. to put the beer in, in some aluminum pie pans, set it out, and then um, you scout. If you get get some slugs, then you know you have an issue. So, but for home gardener, I think, yeah, does it. Did it do a pretty good job, John David, of getting rid of most of them? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, you had to set so you know, out throughout the row and 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 kind of. I, I used it in a high tunnel, really, is what I used it for, and I set probably five on the outside on each side, and then I sprinkled about five or six throughout the high tunnel and on the floor there, and it uh, it it picked them up, and I kept moving them around a little bit, and you know, the plants finally got so big it wasn't an issue. But um, you know that that's kind of how it worked for me. Yeah. Thank you. All right, let me uh, real quick here. We will Friday, June fourth. Some of our upcoming guests. We are having Dr. Clyde Lane talking about reducing hay losses when you're storing your round bales. We know a lot of 
uh, farmers are out there are made hay the last couple of weeks. We had a lot of dry weather. Um, so we want to make sure that we keep that hay ready for, for feeding this winter. Uh, Friday, June 11th, we'll be talking about making quality hay. Uh, Friday, June 18th, we'll be talking about summer fly control uh, with Jake Osborne from Merck Animal Health. I know that uh, especially with the heat we've had, the flies are going to be early this year, aren't they, John David? They are, and I've already had a start on my flies. I've, I've already put ear tags in, and I've been spraying my girls every time I go check on them with a little little fly spray to, you know, get them away from their face. So they're already started. Well, uh, Carlos, we appreciate you coming on the program. I think that we have really had a great discussion today on all kinds of different strategies and, and insect issues in the home vegetable garden and for some of our our uh, small farmers out there that are growing vegetables we appreciate you coming on the program well, thank you thank you for having me okay, and then thank everyone in our in our audience uh, so now that you're officially uh, had your first uh, guest host on the on the uh, Mountaineer farm talk how do you feel that's great <laughs> Did I pass? <laughs> <laughs> we were glad to have you on. Anything else, Evan? That's all I have. Okay. JD? I'll just thank everybody for joining in for Mountaineer Farm Talk, the voice of West Virginia agriculture.